I am so glad that we are finally doing a series on the book of Jonah because it is one of my favorite books of the Bible. Of course, most of us know it because of that reimagined animated series that just rocks the house known as Veggie Tales. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I know, now you're like, oh no, it's in my head. Now, though this may be a whale of a tale, this is certainly not a kid's story. The themes in the book of Jonah are challenging and moving. We get in touch with our deepest struggles as Christians for personal witness, and we have an encounter with the transformative and radical grace of God in this book. This is going to be a great series. But let's set some context. When God called Jonah to speak his word in Nineveh, Jonah was already a very popular preacher. Now to say popular means that he was enjoyed by people, but he was hardly consequential. See, Jonah talked purdy, but his words did not have a profound effect on changing the hearts and minds of God's people. It was business as usual for God's people, Jonah didn't really rock the boat. But then God's call to preach repentance to that city of Nineveh, however, rocked Jonah's world. Because the people of Nineveh were not just outsiders. They were a nightmare to Israel. The last time the Ninevites had visited Israel, it was in the northernmost part of Israel, and they had destroyed several towns. They wiped everyone out. There was no hostages and there was no survivors. A campaign of total destruction. So no, Jonah was not too keen on speaking a word from God there because he knew something about his God. As sincere as God is about correcting and putting a change in people's life is just as sincere, if not more sincere, than God is about forgiving people no matter who they are. So the slightest chance, the smallest prospect of these terrorists being allowed to repent was not what Jonah signed up for. Jonah likely had relatives in those towns. Did you know that? He likely had partners in his ministry in those towns. So no, nope, nope a Jonah had a fine ministry, but now with this calling waiting in the wings, he's deciding that he's going to retire. So Jonah literally left the ministry. Started a shipping business. We know that because he was loud below the decks. He hired non-Israelites. He hired people who didn't know him as a pastor so they wouldn't know pastor him. And he got as far away from Nineveh as you possibly could. If Nineveh is landlocked, he was going out on the sea. He headed in literally the opposite direction of where God was calling him. How many of you know that you cannot flee from the presence of God? What does it say in Psalm 139, verse 7? Where, O Lord, can we flee from your presence? The answer to that is, of course, absolutely nowhere. So God threw a storm at Jonah and his boat. And all the sailors, they knew that they needed help. And so here's the irony. The pagans start praying to their gods while the child of God refuses to lift one little petition to the one true God. Here the roles are reversed in the most humorous way. The non-believers are acting like the believers or at least as the believers should be acting. So they're all praying, right? And then they go down into the boat and they find Jonah and they say, hey, we're going to (laughs) die. So we decided maybe we should start a prayer group. And we wanted to know if you wanted to join in. They are inviting him to join them in prayer. And Jonah refuses. And he fills him in. He says, this storm is from my God because of me. The only solution to throw me overboard because I would rather die 
then do what my God is asking me to do. So if you want the storm to be still, you got to get rid of me. And they're thinking to themselves for like a couple of seconds, hmm, should we? And you know what they did? They just threw him over the side. They heaved Jonah over the side, and the storm stills just long enough for them to see that he was swallowed by a real big fish. Yes, it was a fish. So please set aside any modernist, modernist notions you have of Pinocchio-sized whales. Please scrub from your rationalism from Veggie Tales out of your head. The Bible said it was a big fish, and I firmly believe that's what it was. Why? Because we know the Hebrew word for whale, and that wasn't it. Guess what word they used? They used this word in Hebrew, dog. Everybody say dog. dog. That's how you say fish in Hebrew. Did you know that? A gadol dog, a real big fish. I like to think it was a, a dog fish. I know, these are the dad jokes. They're just that bad. Now, you might be wondering to yourself, why am I making such a big deal about this? Well, as I read the Bible, I notice something about God. God likes to use the weak and the small things in the world to shame what we think looks wise. God intentionally uses the foolish things to shame our strong rationalistic deductions that we often try to do to tame God or to tame the Bible and make it more believable and more explainable as a set of circumstances. But we know that our God uses an impossible way to show us what he can do and make possible. We believe in a God who constantly is challenging our sensibilities. That's literally the story of Jonah. Just look at what St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 to 29, where it says this, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world to shame the things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Of course, St. Paul in this instance is talking about Jesus Christ. But God doesn't make sense of salvation so that we would be saved by some logical deduction. No, he makes his saving work possible by grace alone, through faith alone. And as we're about to see, on account of Christ alone. So, let's go back to this hilarious scene. There was Jonah, like an egg shape in a snake this fish had swallowed Jonah and now it has a Jonah shape is in it okay how hilarious is that now Christopher I wonder what was going through Jonah's head well that's next week's sermon Pastor Craig good luck with that but suffice it to say Jonah thought he was being dragged to hell as a direct and immediate consequence for his obedience or disobedience to God, he literally thought what was happening is that he was being dragged to hell. See, because Jonah knew that he did wrong, and he knew that he was willfully doing wrong, and now he believed that that fish was dragging him into hell as a direct result. I mean, you, could you imagine that? Not so much of a kid's story after all, is it? Amen? What a nightmare. All this prophet could think to do at that moment as he's being carried away to certain doom, all he could think to finally do is to pray. Now he prays. But what he prays is actually very ironic. (laughs) Jonah actually cries out to God for mercy. The very thing that he wanted to keep away from the Ninevites is the very thing he asked for himself from God. So what does God do? He hears him, and he answers him, but not in the way that Jonah expected. Because God wants all people to be saved. 
God doesn't throw Jonah back into his former role as a prophet in the city of Jerusalem. No, instead God throws him up on the shore and sends him back to do the dirty job that he was intentionally running away from before. God turns Jonah around and sets him back on course. Do you know what it's like to be turned around by God? Have you ever been called by God's word to make a change in your life and you refused and God turned you right back to the same spot, the same circumstance, the same exact situation as before? Do you, like Jonah, know divine deja vu sometimes? Anybody? Is God calling you to something difficult Is God persistently trying to get your attention and turning you back around even though you don't want to do it? Is God leading you towards repentance? Well, Jonah's story is a good example of something that we see all over the Bible. It's called passive righteousness. Let's have everybody say that. Passive righteousness. In order to understand what passive righteousness is, you need to understand what the word repent means. You see, a lot of people think that repent is a church word. It means like, oh God, I'm so sorry. It's actually not that meaning. The word repent is an ordinal word. It's a directional word. The word repent means if you're going this way, that now you're going this way. That's what repentance means. And that's literally what God is doing with Jonah in the fish. Jonah was screaming this way to run away from God. And what does the fish do? It turns him around, even though he doesn't want to turn around. You see, we have no righteousness before God of our own. We need to be righteous by God. We need him to actually turn us around because we don't want to turn around. And that's what passive righteousness is. We receive a righteousness from God which is not our own and in that he repents us. That's what Lamentations 5.21 says. It says, repent us to yourself, O Lord, and we will be repented. Even when we don't want to. God turns us around. But this isn't meant to be oppressive and demeaning. Though we may act like a child when something like this happens, I want you to think of it this way instead. This is the gracious working of God, not only in our lives, but possibly for the sake of those around us as well. God's turning you around in your life may actually be for the benefit of the salvation of others. Now perhaps God has already done this in your life. Perhaps he's done it in a big way, but maybe you've never thought of it this way before. In your baptism, God brings us just like Jonah from death to life. And though we bring nothing but fear and rejection and hatred of God, he still graciously turns us around in baptism. He repents us and gives us life and work in his kingdom. That's what Jesus is talking about in our gospel lesson from Matthew. Jesus makes this explicit reference to the sign of Jonah as pointing to how he turns you around. Jesus connects the story of Jonah to his own death and resurrection, emphasizing that being baptized into Christ and being baptized into his death and resurrection means that we're saved. Listen to what Jesus says in our gospel lesson from Matthew chapter 12. Crowds came up to him and said, Lord, give us a sign. And he says, no sign will be given you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The people of Nineveh will rise up in judgment against this generation because when they received preaching, they repented. But I tell you, someone greater than Jonah is here. People want signs, amen? People would love to see a miracle, amen? People want a big show, amen? And we certainly would love that too, wouldn't we? So it can shut down all the enemies and detractors and false religions that terrorize the planet. But Jesus says there is only one sign, one miracle, 
One message. It's his death and resurrection. That's your sign. That's the message. If you're looking for anything else, or if anybody says anything else to you, it's not the message that God has sent. God has sent his only begotten son to bring you from death to life, but he's not going to use a storm, and he's not going to use Nineveh. He's not going to use anything else but Jesus. Jesus is the one who turns this whole world around. Jesus is your means of grace. Jesus is your real big fish. In Christ, God is repenting us even when we don't want to repent. Listen to what St. Paul says in Romans 5, verse 8. But God shows his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, our sinful nature, it flees from God, but God in his mercy, he chases after us and he turns us back to him. This is seen clearest in our baptism. Even if you supposed that your sin was so great that God would have no choice but to just cast you out forever, God has gotten a hold of you in your baptism and it saves. Say, what? Listen to the word of the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from your body, but a pledge of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It saves. Not because it was a ritual done in God's name. It saves because it connects you to Christ by faith. And he is the Savior. But how do you get connected to the sign of Jonah from our gospel lesson? How do you get connected to Jesus' three-day stay in the tomb? Listen again to what St. Paul says. I got a Paul problem this week, all right? Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. But don't you know that all of you who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, you too might walk in the newness of life. For if you have been united with him in a death like his, you shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Jesus is your greater prophet than Jonah. Jesus is your real big fish. He is the means by which you are turned around and sent out like Jonah with a message to share with the world. Have you ever um, wondered why did Nineveh listen to him? Dan, I'm glad that you asked that question. It's a great question. Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever wondered why Nineveh had such a visceral reaction to Jonah's preaching? I mean, they repented hard, amen? They repented so hard that in Jonah chapter 3, verse 7, they even made their pets repent. Come here, Fido. Time to repent. And here's where I think Veggie Tales gets something right. You saw the clip, all right? But in that clip, there's like this super deep cut. They may have lost me in Veggie Tales at the whale, but they were certainly right about the fish. The people of Nineveh knew that there was something fishy going on with Jonah. He was a nobody. He was an outsider, but they still listened. And it wasn't because of his venue, and it certainly wasn't because of the cheese curls that they're talking about in VeggieTales. I don't even know where they got that. Listen, he didn't even preach that passionately. He preached only eight words. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. That's it. That's his whole message. It's only six words in Hebrew. This is not the passionate preaching of somebody all in and convincing people to repent. Some people wish that my sermons were only eight words long. (laughs) Now the reason why they paid attention so much was because of the means by which Jonah got there. He came in a fish. And And in Nineveh, if a man came from a fish, he was a man sent by a God, just not the God that they were thinking about. Here's a picture of the God that they worshipped in Nineveh. His name is Dagon. Everybody say Dagon. 
On the far right, you see that he is a fish man. That's kind of nuts, but that's what they worshipped. On the far left, you see literally a man with like a fish for his top half of his head, and his hair is the rest of a fish. That is pretty nuts, right? And where do you get fish from? How, what's the Hebrew word for fish? Oh, you guys are so good. A for a day. And Dagon is spelled D-A-G, Dag, dog, on. Now, this is literally what they worshipped. He was a fish man. Hilarious but true. What's on the crown of the king of Nineveh in VeggieTales? A fish, yeah. Okay, let's take it off the screen. I don't like having Dagon here at church. So when they hear about a man who came from a fish with a message from God, they paid attention. But Jonah wasn't preaching about the false god Dagon. He came with a message from the God of the Hebrews. Now, you might think, well, then they would disregard it, right? Naturally. But these people had a history with Dagon and Jonah's Hebrew God. And it was a history that scared them to death. Of course, you remember the scene from 1 Samuel chapter 5, right? God's people, um, they lost a battle to the Philistines. They captured the ark and they brought the ark to the Philistine temple of which God? Dagon. Isn't that weird? And when the ark of God was there, went all Indiana Jones style. When they came in, the, the statue of Dagon had fallen down, face down in front of the ark. Huh, that was weird. They were like, wonder why that happened. Maybe there was a draft. So they set the statue of Dagon back up. They come in the next day, and the idol of Dagon has fallen again, but now it's decapitated, and its arms are gone. And they're like, oh no, we're in trouble, right? And there was a plague, and it was really awful, so they sent it back. So, there's been conflict before. But you remember uh, Judges 16, right? The story of Samson. Remember at the end of his life when he was between those two pillars and he, he pushed those pillars and it destroyed all of the Philistines who were worshiping at the temple of Dagon. Isn't that nuts? And they all got squashed like jelly, totally gross. So they were thinking if a man came from a fish and he was a Hebrew, we better listen carefully. Because their God is the God who defeated our God and brought great and terrible judgment on Dagon's worshipers. We're not messing around with that God. So even though Jonah spoke eight dispassionate words, God's word had a total effect on the whole city. Apparently the whole civilization. Could you imagine if we had people walking around this great city speaking just eight words? Maybe this whole city would turn back to God. Maybe the whole nation would turn back to God. Sam, where are you at? Right there, new guy. Listen, what if we went around and we just spoke these eight words around the city? Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Savior. And then people would be like, what? And they would repent. Sam, what if we got this whole congregation to do that? Do you think that they would do it? Amen. Yeah, see the new guy, he puts you on the hook. Well, listen, I'm hesitant to say it, but did you know that we are sent out to speak the word of God like Jonah as well? The truth of the matter is, it's the same way that Jonah flees from Nineveh is the same way that we flee when we think about personally witnessing to people. We have the same reaction to witnessing that Jonah had to Nineveh. We flee. But here's the rub. You don't have to preach like Peter, and you don't have to be as eloquent as St. Paul. Apparently, from our text today, you don't even have to be good at it. <laughs> you don't even have to have power. Because what makes the message good and effective and powerful is that it is God who is the one who is working through his word to make it effective. Hmm? Not you. You remember what it says in Isaiah 55, 11, right? Speaking of the word of the Lord, it says, And so is my word that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish the purpose for which I have sent it. You can agree with me that this whole world needs to turn around. Amen? But the person who's going to do in the turning is not you and me or our eloquent witness. It will be Jesus who turns it around. But how do they know about Jesus unless somebody's going to invite them to know him? 
Listen to Romans chapter 10, verses 13 to 17. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe if they've never heard? And how are they to hear unless someone was speaking? And how are they to speak unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. That's the message of the gospel that we proclaim. Repent and believe in the good news, for the kingdom of God is at hand. These are the first words of Jesus out of Mark. Mark 1, 15. Stories of Jonah and Jesus' teaching show us that through God's act of repenting us in the waters of baptism, we are experiencing the great message of redemption because there is where we're connected to Jesus and sent to speak his word to everyone, even our enemies who haven't yet been invited to know him. We're inviting people to meet our God through our real big fish, Jesus. The greatest catch after taking our deadliest sins rose again to give us a life free from fear and fear of, of death and fear of hell. A life free because our God has made it so. He's made it so through not just the greatest prophet, but your personal Savior, Jesus Christ. God is drawing us closer to him and calling us to join with him through the gospel in his name. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you have called us to speak your word to everyone everywhere. Help us, Lord, to believe this and by believing have eternal life in your name. Amen.